Welcome to our review of Dolce, a deliciously fun game. This is from Stronghold Games, who we have to thank for providing us with a review copy. So Dolce is a confectionery-based board game designed by Julio E. Nazario, featuring artwork by Justine Norte. It was published in September just last year, 2022, by Stronghold Games. This dessert-themed game plays one to four players, with games taking less than an hour, getting quicker the more experienced players have. The game is listed for ages 14 plus with an MSRP of $39.99 US dollars. So in Dolce, players are building a confectionery empire by planting fields, building cafes, harvesting ingredients, and scoring points for completed confections. Every player has their own deck of cards, but will be dealing with the same input each round. Used ingredients can produce byproducts, which can be passed to another cafe or used to feed your chicken. The player who man manages to build the best ingredient engine will score the most points and win the game. For a look at the components you get in this engine builder, check out our Dolce unboxing video on YouTube. Now you will find surprisingly thick player boards for a Stronghold game. I wanted to call this out because Stronghold is known for thin player boards in the past. Maybe they've finally got past that point. An eight page rulebook, a 24 card deck of cards for each of the four players, a wooden scoring meeple and chicken token for each player and plastic ingredient cubes in five colors. There's also a set of four reference cards that I recommend you leave in the box until after you've actually taught the game. While these are great to reference once you know how to play, we found they actually hindered learning the game if read in advance. Yeah. Now, the component quality here is good. Um, I appreciate the thickness of the boards. That's awesome to see. I love the little wooden chicken token. And I dig the plastic ingredient cubes. Like, I gotta admit, the old school gamer in me was like, where's the wooden cubes? But these plastic ones are actually really nice. Um, where the game does lose some points, though, are graphic design choices. Um, these include things like the grid on the player board is a little light, hard to see. The art on the fat on the um, cafe cards is repeated on every card with only minor ch changes. And the iconography for ingredient levels could have been much clearer. Also, this box has a lot of air. I realize this doesn't impact gameplay at all, but the actual game components here take up less than one third of the box. Now we'll get into more detail about that when sharing our thoughts on the game later. Before that, though, let's give an overview of play. So at the start of a game at Dolce, everyone takes a player board scoring meeple and chicken in the color they want to play. The scoring marker and chicken are placed on the zero spot on the outside edge of the board. Um, specifically, we like to put the chickens off the board, just kind of on the outside with the meeple on the actual scoring track. Now one player shuffles their deck and removes four cards from the bottom. Each round, the top card will be drawn from this deck and everyone else will find the matching card in their own decks. Then everyone simultaneously has to decide what to do with that card. Now this card can be converted into a cafe. You play it face up beside your player board. Cafes turn ingredients into points. Each cafe requires two different ingredients, the level of which depends on the specific cafe card. Now, before we go on, we need to talk a bit about ingredients, <laughs> as they are the most complicated part of this game. There are four ingredients, peanuts, cacao, vanilla, and coffee. Each of these can be at three different quality levels. Your bean, ground bean, and butter. Different cafes require different ingredients at different quality levels. For example, the Fudge Cafe requires pure cacao and ground peanut to score. The cafes which are pre-printed on your player boards all require pure beans. So freshly harvested ingredients come out as pure beans. They can be placed on cafes needing pure beans or any lower level of the same ingredient. The tricky part here, though, is after a cafe scores, the ingredients used are removed from there, but they downgrade one level and can then be passed on to another cafe that could then potentially score. Trust me, this confuses everyone at first, and the small icons on the cafes showing ingredient levels don't help with this. We'll get into ingredient levels a bit more when we get to scoring. So the next option for when you've got your card is to use it to plant fields. 
You're going to place the card on your player board upside down and fill it with the four resources sewn on the back of the card. Now, note, if you cover up an existing field with a matching ingredient, you get to put a bonus cube. Now, the most cubes on a single spot can hold this two. And if you end up covering up an existing cube you hadn't harvested yet, that ingredient is fed to your chicken. The final action is harvest. You discard your card and choose one row or column on your player board and take all the ingredient cubes from that line. Each cube must be placed into a cafe or fed to your chicken if you don't have room. Now, after harvesting, you can also have your chicken lay eggs. Eggs cost three each and are wild ingredients that can be used to fill any one cafe ingredient spot, but don't produce byproducts. After all players have chosen and completed one of the three actions with their cards, you then move on to a scoring phase. Any player that has any full cafes must score them. They score one point for the full cafe, then remove the ingredients from that cafe. They then can move any byproducts produced to a different cafe. When removed from a cafe, each ingredient downgrades one level. Your beans turn into ground beans, and ground beans turn into butter. Butter has no byproduct, so any butter used is just discarded. If you run out of places to place byproduct, you instead feed it to your chicken. Through this system, you'll be trying to set up chains where you're going to use the byproducts of one or two cafes to fuel another. And then byproducts from that cafe may fuel another and so on. With this, you can even use the same cafe more than once, kind of setting up a loop, but never an infinite loop because of the way it's designed. Now, the game continues for 20 rounds and the players with the most point wins. In the case of a tie, players produce as many eggs as they can and then total their number of eggs with the number of ingredients left in their fields. The player with the most ingredients total wins. Now, what we just described are the two to four player rules. Dolce can also be played solo. To do this, you just use one deck of cards. You shuffle it, you remove four, and then play as normal. Uh, you literally play the same game. Decide to do with each of the 20 cards left in your deck. At the end of the game, check the back of the rule book to see how well you did, and get a rank somewhere from Baking Beginner to Macaron Master. And now you have a pretty good idea of how to play Dolce. Let's move on to our thoughts on this baking board game. So when Stronghold Games first contacted me about reviewing Dolce, I gotta say I was intrigued. The, the initial press release had me interested. Uh, the theme here was a big draw. While there are a few dessert-making games out there, like I own King Chocolate and Just Desserts, it's far from a common theme. It's definitely no zombies or Lovecraft. And I also really like this, the sound of the byproduct system, at least as described in the press release. Engine builders like this can be a really great game. The intricacies of developing a chain that plays out from field to product till the ingredients are used up is definitely one that is attractive. Plus, I also have a soft spot for what people have been calling bingo style games. These are games where every player gets the same input every round and has to do something with it. I've enjoyed this in games like Tiny Towns, Number 9, and Railroad Inc. Now, what I love about this style of game is that despite everyone dealing with the exact same things, all having the same inputs, everyone ends up going their own way, which ends up with everyone having totally different result at the end of the game. Now, while I won't say I'm as in love with this game style as Mo, there is a fun factor knowing that while everyone had the same input, that resultant outputs are rarely even slightly similar yeah now i'm pleased with all the aspects i was looking forward to right from 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 expectation to playing the game dolce fully delivered the theme really is great and it's well integrated through the byproduct system and even the chicken system feels thematic though i gotta say the amount of coffee we fed our chickens in our games is somewhat concerning not only do you get a cool pretty unique theme you get interesting mechanics that are well tied to that theme it's best not to think too hard about what it is you're feeding the chickens. Just imagine happy, plump chickens. Yes. Now, the real highlight here is this whole byproduct system and the engine building that's required to make the most out of it. Well, it sounds pretty simple to do in theory. Whoever designed what cafe takes what was very good at making it much more difficult than you'd think. Uh, this is there's actually a lot of strategy and thought required to pull off a solid engine in Dolce. And that alone means this game's not going to be for everyone. 
Now, one potential weakness of this design is that there are only 24 cards, 20 of which will be available in any game. Now, while removing four cards prevents perfect information, I'm not sure that given enough plays, memorization won't come into play. Though, I'll say it's going to take more than five plays. So in this case, I think that might be more of a feature than a hindrance because knowing what cards may be coming might actually be more interesting and hoping for, you know, the fudge to come out in the second half of the game and not at the end could actually be a strategy point. For me, I actually love this complexity. I was really impressed. I like that this game is actually quite meaty, despite what seems like simple rules. Like, I would literally put this in the category that you call thinky fillers, what people like to call thinky fillers. Shorter games that are going to appeal to medium to heavy Euro fans. What this means, though, is this is not a quick, fun party style. Let's make some desserts. Let's all use the same cards. Oh, what'd you do with yours kind of game? This was actually amusing, as even after reading the rules, most still thought this was a super light game that might not really be to our taste. Then we played it the first time, and it was immediately clear yeah. that this was not the light fluff that we were expecting. Yeah, I totally thought that the byproduct system was going to be really simple. They are like, I'm going to be easily be able to use all my three ingredients through all three stages, setting up these fun combos. No, it's not. Uh, well, the whole byproduct system works really well, and it is fun to play with. Uh, it, it, it's, it does have some problems. So, and all of these problems have to do with the iconography that was used to represent ingredient levels. Instead of, like, I would have liked to have seen a nice big one, two, or three over the ingredients, or, or bright different colors, like uh, green, red, and yellow, right? Red means stop, which means, you know, for butter, you don't use that ingredient or you're done with it. Yellow means you can get one more use, right? Instead of that, they have little tiny icons with little thin rings around them. Your beans have three rings, ground beans have two rings, and butter has one or none. I don't even know if you call that one ring. Well, I, that's part of the problem is that the differential between these rings is so, unless you've got a two next to a three, it's yeah. not always clear. Yeah, these could have been much clearer. And then two of the ingredient icons actually look similar. I, I've yet to play a game of Dolce where someone didn't go, is that a two or a three ring? multiple times during the game indeed you find yourself constantly double checking if it's coffee or peanut if you've got two cafes with two rings or one with three and one with two rings and then double checking to make sure you planted the right beans or if you've just made a horrible mistake and ruined your engine now what confuses me even more about this is that the icons are small and kind of off to the side uh, presumably to show off the art Right. It's it's the, the game mechanic stuff is kind of hidden in a corner. And here's this nice big picture of a cafe, which would be great if the cafes were interesting. Every single cafe in this game is identical, except for minor color differences and the words on the signs that are so small, you probably need a magnifying glass to read them anyway. I might have understood if they were showing off 24 totally unique looking cafes, each done by a different board game artist. But that's not what's happening here. There is no play benefit to any of the art involved in the cards except for the ingredients required, and yet those ingredients are not the featured element or even especially well-defined to be used with a mere glance. You need yeah. to pick up that card and look at it to say, oh, okay, no, that is Cacao 2 and Peanut 3 or so whatever. Yeah. And to add to that, it's not even like the three ingredients are always listed below or above the two ingredients. Though we did notice there is a set order to their end, but it's based on the ingredient type, which doesn't really matter as much. Right. But it would have been better that whatever the most one always, whatever costs the most should be on the top. Whatever costs the least should be at the bottom, in my opinion. Or some, anyway. something more standardized than something, what they've anything. used. Um, so another issue we found is how the player aids are written. Usually when teaching a board game, I will hand out whatever provided player aids they are while I'm teaching so the players can kind of follow along as I describe things. I almost talking about step one here. Here's the summary. Yep, that's what he said. You don't want to do this with Dolce. Uh, it's not that they're terrible. The information on them is useful, but you kind of have to know the game and have learned to play to be able to use these because of how they're written. This was a shocker as reference cards are just something I use 
to jumpstart my knowledge while a game is being set up or the teacher is skimming the rules as a refresher. Uh, it's a way that I can front load some information to make the teacher's job easier. And yet doing that for both myself and Deanna led to enough confusion that our first game ended up quite confused as we had gotten yeah. some incorrect ideas from the cards that hadn't been, you know, wiped out and, and erased by the teach. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I clearly remember that first game going, but where are you getting that from? You're like, but I thought it did this. I'm like, that's not what I said. Where, why, why are you getting this from? Because it this says it right here on the card. And you're like, it says it here. And I'm like, and honestly, bad on me for not even reading the reference cards. I learn by reading rule books. So I don't tend to even look at reference cards. By the time I'm playing, I've usually internalized most of the game. That's just how I learn games. So I didn't look at them. I am moving on. I, unfortunately, I have a final complaint about the game. Um, and this is going to be an issue for some people and not for others. This game is totally, completely, 100% multiplayer solitaire. While playing Dolce, you don't interact with the other players at all. Technically, one player has to call out a card so that everyone else grabs it, but that has no impact on play. The other players at the table, what they're doing has absolutely nothing to do with what you're doing, and there is no way to impact other players at all. And sadly, this is just the nature of the game, but it can become problematic when players are working at different speeds. Mm -hmm. Since the player who is turning their cards can either be racing ahead or be constantly behind with the other players getting frustrated because they just want to move ahead and, and find out what the next mm -hmm. card is. Yeah, if, I, if players have AP, it holds up the whole group, even though it's a simultaneous play game. Like, I honestly think you could play this game so one player could shuffle their deck, give the number order to everyone else, they can put their cards in order, and then just do their own thing, and then compare scores in an hour. <laughs> right? Like, you could almost say the only reason is, is you might spoil because you'd have to look through the cards to know what's coming, which would, but if there's a way to like, you know, hold the cards so you just see the little numbers to sort them, which is probably can be done. Or even as it is, you could have players playing in separate rooms or online, which honestly, I got to say is the bright side of this lack of interaction. This would this be a means, fantastic implementation on BGA. Yes, I agree. But this, even not on BGA, can be an awesome game to play online at any player count as long as each person has their own copy of the game. Or you hand out decks ahead of time. Like, hey, we're going to play this Saturday. Take a set of these cards home in this player board, and you take a set of these cards home in this player board. Like, I honestly, you could stream a game of Dolce with 100 players. The streamer just has to read off what card's next each round, and it would work. Yep. Hmm. Overall, I like Dolce. It's got a distinctive theme that actually comes out while you play the game. It's at this point the heaviest bingo style I've played, and it's much deeper than the pretty straightforward rules would seem to indicate. Even describing it above and talking about it sounds simpler than it is. Trust me, this is a thinky filler game that my medium to heavy Euro friends, 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 fan friends, fan friends really dig. While there isn't any player interaction to speak of, I've really enjoyed trying to figure out the puzzle that is Dolce each time I play. And that's basically what it is. It is a single player puzzle where the player who puzzles the best is going to win the game. Be aware, though, especially for anyone with vision issues, the minimal graphic style can lead to issues. Now, if you're looking for a thinky filler, something to play solo or with medium to heavy Euro fans, you should check out Dolce from Stronghold Games. But if you were expecting a light, light dessert making party game, uh, something fun to play with your friends and socialize while you're playing, you're probably going to want to stay away from this one. That is, unless you're in the mood to try something that requires some thought and lots of planning. But if you're looking for something light, I'd recommend checking out Just Desserts instead. Now, if you like other bingo style games, again, these are games where everyone deals with the same input each turn and everyone has to use the same resources. You really should check out Dolce. For me, this is the best bingo based game I played. For the rest of you, this is very much a try before you buy. Find someone who knows the game well to teach you. Ignore the reference sheets until you need them and dig into building, planting and harvesting peanuts, cacao, coffee and vanilla while keeping those chickens well fed. Well, that's it for our review of Dulce. 
a confectionery empire building engine builder from Stronghold Games with surprising depth. Yes. Now, before I go, I do want to invite you to check out my written review of Dolce over at the Tabletop Bellhop blog, where I was able to get into a bit more detail than we were able to cover here tonight. 